Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Craig Spencer. I'm the Managing Director of the Carter and Spencer Group based here in Brisbane. I'm delighted to be the, um, the chair of this session. First of all, I'd like to thank the, uh, the sponsors of this, um, of this session, VisiBoard. They've been great supporters of the PMA and the fresh produce industry in Australia for, for many years, and we appreciate their, their continued support. And I encourage you to go and visit their booth in the, in the uh, trade show um, at lunchtime today if you haven't already done so. On January the 26, 2009, at a United Nations summit held in Madrid, James Duo, the head of the UN's Food and Agricultural Organization, said that global food production must double by 2050 to feed the projected global population of 9 billion people. We ask ourselves, is this an opportunity for food producers in Australia to take up this shortfall globally, or do we just focus on supplying our own backyard? Before we can come to a conclusion, we need to consider the following on both a global and domestic scale. Do we have enough suitable land to farm this growth? Do we have enough water? Do we have enough labour? Do we have the technology? How do we fund this growth? And most importantly, is it fin financially viable? And today's session topic, what are these fruits and vegetables crops of the future? I think it would be fair to say from the discussions that have taken place so far in this conference that our focus is on in developing consumer consumption on an Australia and New Zealand level. And we've heard of the terrific initiatives of Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Week to be held in November this year. So in this session, we're fortunate to have Dan Ryan from Plant and Food Research and Peter O'Keefe from Monsanto, Australia, to share with us their work on these fruits and vegetables of the future. Our first speaker is Dan Ryan. Dan is the Australian Business Manager for Plant and Food Research, a New Zealand Crown Research Institute working in horticulture, seafood and arable sectors. Dan has an extensive background in horticultural research, management and business development in Australia and prior to his current appointment was Senior Prog Program Manager for Horticultural Australia. Dan's long history of engagement with Australian, New Zealand and Vietnamese industry and research inst institutes provides a holistic view of innovation in the fresh food industry in Australasia and experience in the food issues of developing nations. Please welcome Dan. Are we on? Yeah, we're on. Uh, so, in looking at this title of this talk, you know, uh, Future uh, Fruit and Vegetables to Feed the World, Initially, I thought of all the normal things about a shortage of land and, um, you know, growing populations and things like that. Then I thought, you know, well, how does it apply to the audience that's going to be in this room? And the audience that's in this room is about making a living or making a profit from fruit and vegetable production in Australia and New Zealand. And we're high cost producers. And so we're not, we're not in the market, I don't believe, to... Um, to, to do broad feeding the world type issues. What we're about is, is the premium markets. And if we're going to be a market, world market player, I think we have to be in that premium sector. And that's, that's plant and food researchers' uh, view of the world. And so what I've um, done with this talk is, is rather than to discuss a lot of those population issues and, and land availability issues, I wanted to talk to you about, uh, as a case study, our institute. And, and what it does in terms of how it operates and where it sees the future for fruit and vegetable um, varieties that you people can grow and sell, and what we're doing and, and what are our drivers to, to help you get there. So I'll give you a little bit of a talk about um, what plant and food research is, and it's the drivers for our breeding, um, what we're breeding, the science behind the breeding. So and I don't mean just the breeding science, I mean all the other things that we're bringing into that. It's a very complex field now. Some of our successes, and we've had some outstanding successes, 
and then a little bit of taste of some of the future products. So um, plant and food research, um, we're a science-based company. We're a little, for those Australians in the audience who don't know us, we are a company. We're owned by the New Zealand government, um, but run by a board of directors, so we're a bit of a quasi-organisation. Um, and um, we work in fruit, vegetables, seafood and arables, as I talked before. And we really see ourselves as operating in that premium end of that market. So in terms of corporate structure, as the New Zealand government is the um, owner, um, two ministers are the shareholders, technically. Um, we come from two organisations that some might know, so our legacy organisations were crop and food research, which was vegetable and seafood and arables, and hort research, which was fruit. I come from the hort research side. Um, and we're about 900 um, people. Our income is about 50% private and 50% public. That of that private, um, about 20% of that is royalty. So about 10% of our overall income is, is royalty income. So we've been quite successful so far in our variety development. And we're largely New Zealand based and spread right across New Zealand. Head office in Auckland, um, a major office in Lincoln, which is just outside Christchurch, luckily. Had a major impact on a lot of our staff, but luckily our office survived. Um, and business offices in Australia and the US. And we're about that, about scientific discovery and innovation to grow the prosperity, health and sustainability of New Zealand's foods, plant and seafood resources. And so the Australian in the audience are going, well, what does that mean to us? Um, that's our core mission, but in achieving that, we have to be successful internationally. There's a strong belief in the organisation we have to be successful internationally. As I believe most of the people in this room have to be successful in the international if we're going to survive. So our science is divided up into four groups. And I'm running you through this so you get an understanding of what's behind the Science Institute. So breeding and genomics, and their tagline, breeding um, better cultivars faster. And I'll go through that faster bit a bit later. That's a really important issue. But all of these groups tie back into our breeding. So bioprotection, residue-free pest and disease control, one of the best ways to do residue-free pest and disease control is to have resistant varieties. Sustainable production, sustainable and profitable production systems ties back to that field the world, feed the world. If you're designing varieties that are more efficient in the water use, that take less resource use to grow, then that's a sustainable thing. It feeds back into the variety area. And then food innovation. I'll talk a little bit about food because um, we've got like a lot of institutes, a real health focus in some of our research, but we see the way that we will take our health products to the world is through better and new varieties. So that's our focus. Now that may not be whole foods, it may be whole foods, so you may be selling a piece of fruit or a vegetable that's got that health tag to it, but it also may be um, that it's an ingredient or a part of something else. So breeding and genomics group, to talk a little bit about the breeding genomics group, um, New and novel fruit, um, and I guess there's a, a case that many of you might know there as an example, that novel fruit is the gold kiwi fruit that we bred. So um, rather than just produce more green kiwi fruit and more green kiwi varieties, what can we do different in that area? And so the gold kiwi fruit was a, one of our first examples of a different fruit in the kiwi fruit industry. It's not only gold, as you know, it's, take, it's got a different flavour profile. So it's mixing the attributes that we're talking about. And gold kiwi fruit sales have not cannibalised green kiwi fruit sales at all. So what it was, it's a, it was a whole new product, a whole new sector that, that opened up. And that's what we're talking about a lot in this area, is, is, is not cannibalising our products, but new and exciting products that can create new opportunities for our clients. Um, and it's that premium pricing. You know, we are high cost producers in Australia and New Zealand. And if we're going to re uh, remain high cost producers, then we need to be selling premium products that are IP protected. We're doing it through extensive germplasm collections. That's a, you can do all the science you like, but unless you've got that broad germplasm collection to mine, then you're really on the back foot from the start. And then the genomics research, and we'll talk a bit about that to underpin it. The food innovation high value plant and seafood products for food and beverage markets. Uh, again, 
it comes back to that breeding. We see the way that we do that. So we're doing research, and this is medical, so we're doing medical trials, proper clinical trials to establish these benefits. And our aim is to then find ingredients or um, products from fruit and vegetables that have a defined health benefit that we can then breed our varieties for and then you can grow those varieties as a premium product for the health. So that's our, our target area in that food area. So we're not wanting to produce a fruit drink or something like that ourselves. What we're aiming at is producing the varieties that will enable you to produce that premium product. And doing it, as I said, with clinical trials so you can make valid health claims. So, you know, we're a New Zealand um, institute owned by the government, so our drivers are New Zealand industry based. So to give you a feel for what some of those drivers are, the horticulture sector at the moment in New Zealand is $5.6 billion per annum. We want to grow that by 2020 to $10 billion per annum, or the industry wants to grow it by that. The fruit and beverage sector, $44 billion by 2016 from $27 billion. And that's including new whole fresh foods and ingredients from propriety, New Zealand derived germplasm. So this is a germplasm area again. Integrated production systems across the supply chain. Um, moves towards non-chemical pest and disease control. Again, that's that tie back there. And you know, a lot of you in the room will be hearing that discussion about eco-verification out of Europe. Um, you know, one thing in eco-verification is to have the systems to, to be able to verify but you want to be able to produce in a minimum impact way. And so it's supporting what story you can tell in eco-verification. And, um, and that ties back to that footprint. So market access through a reduced footprint. So that's our industry drivers. Um, what are we doing to support our industry drivers? So we're there to support industry drivers. Um, and we believe our best way, it's not all our research, but it's certainly a, a lot of our research ties back to it, is, is the genomics and the, and the breeding tools that will develop the cultivars that provide those answers. So cultivars tailored for predictive production systems and environments. Um, it's um, you know, targeted um, pest and disease risk. And, and this is where the genomics ties in. You know, in old breeding systems, you would um, test a, a, a new variety against a, a pest or disease, and if you saw resistance, that's great, you'd claim resistance. But that resistance may have been single gene resistance. And single gene resistance is not much use. And you don't know it's only single gene resistance, and it's not much use. It's just like putting the same chemical on all the time and not having a varied spray program. Um, that resistance is going to break down. And if you're talking about a tree crop, well, it's not going to be much use to you. Maybe in a vegetable crop you can work that way, but not in a not in a tree crop. So you need to have stacked resistance genes. And the only way you're gonna know that is if you know what the genes are for that resistance and you've got markers to check for those genes. As I said, provide new food and beverage ingredients based on knowledge of wellness and consumers. And we've got a whole stack of clinical trials and cell-based assays and things that are developing into that area. Some of the other drivers, you know, we talked about increased population before and we do take that, but do increase land availability the, um, the loss of productive land, the reduced land productivity, and I, I say that in terms of um, the fact that we've been mining some of our farms for a while, but also because you know, the best land is often around the um, urban areas and urban creep is pushing you out into less productive so lands. Environmental pr um, pressures, reduced pesticides, whether that be a real pressure or not, or just a market pressure. Eco-verification that I talked about before. Carbon, you know, I've heard talk lately um, we, we've, there's the topic here at the moment is, is the carbon tax. And everyone's going, well, I can't survive the carbon tax. But we're hearing out of Europe that if we don't have a carbon tax, when we try to sell our produce there, we're going to be carbon taxed anyway. Because they're going to tax us because we haven't got one. So somewhere along the line, we're going to have to address that issue. Um, and the regulatory issues, as I said, that carbon tax, the, the proof of claims, health. That's our breeding pipeline. Um, I won't go too far through it, but you know, um, I guess the key things are there, the genetic studies feeding in, so we're not just doing crosses. We're looking at genetic studies, finding those genes. We're developing selection indices, molecular markers, 